We hit record. All right. Gentlemen, Building Restoration Corporation is here to give a presentation on what they can do for us and our church. Boys, take it away. Come on up. You got to talk through this because we are recording the system. So, yeah, you, you'll be on the YouTube. YouTube. On the YouTube. Not a problem. Um, has everyone had a chance to look at this yet? I don't know who has or has not. Just the board members? Okay. All right, so this is the proposal we've prepared for you. Um, we feel that it's a, it's a safe and effective approach to kind of maintain the exterior of the church as well as protect it. And I guess it would be revitalize specifically the two towers of the church, which seem to be the most prominent aspect of a church, specific, um, <laughs> excuse me, specifically for this one. I know when I'm looking for the church coming down the street there, I just look for the two towers and it's definitely what catches my eye. This is just a okay. I'll skip through some of the wordy stuff here. I did bring some extra proposals if anyone wants to read through this. People able to read that? So basically what's indicated here within the squares are previous attempts at tuck pointing where they've been successfully repointed. However, the mortar is not matching. So the previous Mason didn't have access to or just did not color match the mortar to the existing mortar. And that can be for a couple different reasons. Um, but one thing that we do is we have about a hundred. So about a hundred different colors we have that be able to properly match the mortar. And in this proposal is the 100% repointing of both towers, which means we would remove all the current mortar and replace it with a new matching mortar to match the rest of the church. Or if you wanted to go with a, a different color, you know, that would be up to you, but we do have a matching mortar. We did find one. And if you choose to continue to just partially repoint, the, the church here, you're going to continue to see these different areas of discoloration. It said the, uh, some of these problem areas around the louvers and stuff is what's causing the interior um, interior walls of the clock towers to crumble up a little bit, the moisture. So repointing the whole perimeter of that would definitely help. And I've got in uh, the PowerPoint we have, I have more information specifically on the, <clears throat> the inside of those towers. Indicated here are just a few other areas that were previously tuck pointed. Um, this is another reason why we would recommend the full repointing of the tower. Um, this would eliminate all these arrows and all the discoloration there and different color mortars. And we were out here last year about this time to take pictures. And this is the damage that occurred just over the course of the one year. So on the left was taken last year and on the right was taken this year. Now it, it can be subtle, but if you follow the arrows, you can see where the deterioration has continued. And this would be just over the course of one year. These are some of the areas that are the highest priority um, that have mortar completely missing from the joints and that are allowing water to directly come in. And I believe you can see kind of some of the results of the water infiltration happening up here. So this is in the towers now. The interior of the towers were coated with a plaster and then they were coated again and again and again. We counted four different layers of plaster up there. And what this plaster is doing is it's trapping moisture inside the brick, which is uh, bricks need to breathe. That's why people don't recommend that you paint masonry. It needs to breathe. And this kind of coating has trapped the moisture in there and 
deteriorated it to the point where it's starting to crumble? You indicated there's four different layers up there? Yes, that's what we counted. <clears throat> It looks to me like they're trying to keep a consistency with the, there's no real reason why they would do that, I don't know, but they're trying to keep some kind of consistency because it looks really consistent around the outside of it. But I mean, why, why uh, so at some point somebody decided to put, put that on. Do you believe that was I, kind of a original construction? I think they were trying to keep the structure together. There's probably already problems behind it and they're trying to keep the structure intact by coating it. So do you think it was four separate applications at different points in time, or it, it was? It could have been multiple applications, or maybe at one time. I'm not really clear. Pardon? There's different thicknesses on each coat, so the inner wall wasn't really consistent. So I'm assuming they were, and it, it, they used multiple materials to patch that inner wall before they parged it. So the parging probably happened at a different point in time. Yeah. I can't really tell you if they did it all at once or like multiple coats or. Can you think of a scenario where you might recommend parsing like that? Um, yeah, I mean, that's basically what we're gonna do when we're done with this. We're gonna pull this off and get a more um, compatible material that will coat, coat it and still let the wall breathe. And in the meantime, while we'll be fixing all the holes and you know, making a nice solid structure again because there's, from when I ripped the pieces or the two foot sections off, especially around the louvers, there's not much there, which is probably why you're getting water up in the roof line and it's crumbling apart. I mean, we were there a year ago and you had one of your guys clean that a year later and it looks worse now than it did last year. What was that again? Can you explain that again? Last time. We're, And it's even worse than it was. So the moisture is basically deteriorating that brick to the point where it's almost a powder now. So to really see what you got, what kind of problem you have, you got to remove that coating. So you remove that coating, and then you need to have a sound surface. Yes, to apply the new product. Yeah. Um, how do we get the new coating or the, the oh, basically I'd take out any kind of broken brick, any kind of, anything that looks problematic, wet areas, defaced brick, and there might be possible repointing in that whole area where you have to cut out mortar and replace it, just like the perimeter of the tower themselves do. Yeah, it's a mixture of both. How does the clay tile stand? Not, I mean, that's what, that's probably the worst part of it all. I mean, the clay tile retains a lot of water and moisture. So that's probably what's causing that. I know you did not, uh, it's not um, been demolished to the actual camera. Uh, curious, I'm sure you were there. Based on your experience, you fixing quite a bit of brick and tile that need to be replaced. From what I from what I've seen, there was uh, sections of the wall where the coating is really bonded nicely to it. So that area probably isn't as bad as the soft areas, but there was areas where I could basically take a hammer and a chisel and pop it right off. Which means it's lost its bond to that brick. And I mean, those are the really bad areas, but there might be areas in there where the brick is solid and you don't have to do anything, you know? We won't really know until we open it up. Is the quote said something about 30%? 30%? I think it's going to be 30% of the tower, the tower of the brick piece. Would we be expecting 30% of that area? I would have to reread that. Um, but what we do know, we have a price to fix very little of it, and we have a price to fix everything. And we know it's not everything because we've already chiseled some away where it's it's was in good shape. Yeah. I 
opened up I opened up multiple, multiple spots up there and there was areas where it looked like it was solid the substrate substrate was pretty solid you know nothing really needed to be done to it a lot of the damage is around the louvers themselves so a lot of that might need rebuilt I'm assuming it will need rebuilt which is probably why the outside looks that bad too These are areas throughout the rest of the church. So now we're moving on from the towers. We estimated about 30% repointing, excuse me, of the rest of the church area. basically go around the building and pick and choose I would the on-site foreman I would go around and determine which areas look like your worst areas the parts that need to need the immediate attention obviously the whole building doesn't need it but like where you got the effervescence there that means there's water infiltration and that needs to be cut out and repointed so we get rid of that but basically I would go around the building in a lift and map out each area on in pinpoint to my guys this these are where we need to go at you know to fix things Any spots where we would see deep face brick around the building, we would replace that also, right? Yeah. Yep. So with the water infiltration, you're gonna you're, you're gonna see brick faces spalled off. Those will be pulled out and replaced with new ones. You have a brick match already, right, Dennis? I think we do have some brick left. Yeah. Yeah. From the yeah. addition. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if, how many we if not, we could go out and find some. Yeah. So we could also source the bricks to a different vendor as well. Um, but we would look for bricks until you guys are, you find one that you feel is a match. Yeah. Um, from my understanding, the last bricks that were used were approved as a match. So that would be up to you whether you wanted us to. Yeah, I, I, I don't know, but I'm not so sure that the bricks at the touch point were ever added or approved. I think they were. They might have been left over Well, we we match brick all we match brick all the time. I do it all the time. So, so I can provide the brick samples. Let's, let's talk a little bit about your civil procedure. I'm sorry, the what procedure? Procedure. So, so you're sourcing brick, you're sourcing uh, order color. What what type of civil approval process do you go through to find your own Sure. Um, so usually that's all discussed in our pre-construction meeting. Um, we call it a pre-con where we'll kind of go through the process. We'll lay out what it is we're going to be sourcing, where it's going to be coming from, and at what point we would need it to be approved by. Yep, we would provide mock-ups as well, color samples. So before we choose a color of a mortar, we would bring in our cases and we have a display with about 100 different colors and we could go through there and you could pick a color you like that's going to match you know, the different well, sections of the building. Mm -hmm. Probably someone who's not colorblind. Did you mention the mock up? Did you mention the mock up? Those are going to be a mock up panel for us to look at and approve? Yes. Yep. Yeah, I think we do have a mock up. Yeah, 
uh, the question was asking about a mock-up. So we would, that would be something that we would arrange during the pre-construction meeting so we could all agree on what needs to be done before we move on to the next step. Some of the beaded limestones failed, so we go around the building and determine the bad areas of that, cut it out, repoint it, make it look just like the existing beaded mortar. There wasn't a ton of that. I think only 150 lineal feet, which is a relatively small amount in comparison to the, it might sound like a lot, yeah. but it gets eaten up pretty quick when you have so many joints like that. Overall, So you were asking earlier about with the sealant and what we do, and it's um, caulking or sealant, they're kind of interchangeable in this situation, but it would be removing all the old sealant, cutting it out, <clears throat> and then priming when you do prime every time? Put it, yeah, putting, uh, well, if you guys determine you want to use primer on the, on the stone or on the brick, um, we would cut it out, put a bond breaker on the back side of that sealant joint so it's got a place to give with the walls and replace it with um, whatever type of sealant you would determine. We can give you multiple options on that too, on what you guys wanna use. Uh, different qualities, different colors, and that would be all something, again, we do submittals with um, that we would lay out in a pre-construction meeting. And anytime you see kind of cracks in the sealant like this, or if you go and you, a good test is if you push a pen on it and it is spongy and it comes right back. That's usually a sealant that's in pretty good condition, but when it's it's failing or it doesn't sponge back as consistently, then you're gonna have um, a failed sealant. Also any kind of cracks like that are a pretty... These are just additional areas that the ceiling would need to be replaced at. Stones, we would be uh, basically demo, dem demoing those out and uh, recasting them in place or we could get stones made and set. We have a local vendor here that does the pre cut I like the, the cut limestone, which is what we had bid in the original proposal. Um, if you wanted to go a different route, we'd be happy to entertain that as well. Um, but the, the limestone replacement would be replacing what's there with the same material. So these are the general conditions. Um, ultimately, this is the our access to the building and everything it's going to take us to get from start to finish for the construction process. And this is all the physical work that would be done. It's the the sealant around the perimeter of the window. The glass. So the perimeter of the window has uh, got sealant around it. The glass itself, we would cut that out and replace that. You got a couple, a couple small ones over there. Yeah, how many lineal feet was it? It's a, okay. it's a small amount. I'm trying to figure out what, what it is, why we're calling out place of glazing on each side, um, but not the other one. I think those are the only ones that were failed. Um, we can take a look out here back and point it out specifically 
if you'd prefer that. Um, otherwise, we do have more pictures of it that I can show you, if not on the presentation, though. But we could have just called it sealant. You know, ultimately, it, a lot of people use the same word for both things, but glazing is technically different. So that's why it's singled out on here. So when you use the term sealant, you're, you're talking about the cost. Correct. So there's sealant, which is the caulk, and there's sealer, which is what we apply to the exterior of the masonry to help it uh, prevent against water infiltration. So just stay on the, the sealing terminology for a second. The last item, you have uh, the barrier in Washington, sealing brick. What do you mean by sealing He's, he's talking about the purging, the new uh, coating of uh, cementous material on the outside, inside of the brick, on the outside of the brick, on the inside of the tower. Excuse me. That's what he's talking about. So it would be the coating that's in there now, removing yeah. that and then replacing it with a one-way barrier, a sealer, which would allow water in but not out. And so when you say sealer, so are you? So maybe I shouldn't be saying sealer. Sealer is not as descriptive it would be a parge okay. i guess if it's going to use so the a yeah it will be mm -hmm. parge as opposed to like a or selling type of thing yeah like I didn't catch that, I'm sorry. So, so we talked about sealing brick and stone underneath the cementitious material. So the cementitious material is the part of the material, and the sealing is... So when I, when I was describing that, I was referring to the area that is underneath the current material. So it won't be layered when I say sealing the... See, so you're looking at the last line item? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's repairing and replacing, washing and sealing the brick and stone under the cementous material. That's the stone that the, the material that's up there right now beneath that is what we'd be sealing. And, and how would you seal it there? That would be with the parge. Okay. Um. Stone course at the bottom with the roof line. From there up. So the three lines up, up uh, at the top. Yeah. There. That belt course. And then from there and below. 30%. 30%. And that 30% excludes the new addition. There was no point in needing a new addition. Uh, could we move over to the PowerPoint, please?
So in the PowerPoint here, we just have a few things that Stan had um, expressed concern about, and I just wanted to highlight a few of the things that we spoke of. One big thing was the tuck pointing attempts here. It's easier to see them side by side. You can see what is marked and what isn't marked. Um, if you're looking on the left, you should be able to identify where it has been previously pointed and where incorrect brick was used, I'm assuming, but now that was brick from the new edition that was used. Okay. 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 This is a restoration of an altar we did in Minnesota. It was two summers ago. This is one of the before pictures here. And after this had 100% repointing, um, a cleaning and some stone replacement, as well as an overall uh, chemical cleaning for the masonry. Actually, I just have one, two more, there we go. This was a separate church that was then downtown Minneapolis. How was that stone made? Uh, chemical wash. The different type of cleaners to use on each different type of uh, subject. And basically let it sit on there, soak, and then you pressure wash it off. That's part of the training there. Was it like a PSP? Was it acidic? Was it? Yeah. It's it's acidic, but as uh, times have changed, obviously they're coming out with better products that are a little more um, biological or easier on the environment. This summer we've got a project down by, it's uh, the Gates of Heaven Synagogue down in downtown Madison, and it's right by the lake and they want a full complete cleaning so we've got to use a very specific biological cleaner. And while we're cleaning it, we have to catch all of the water that comes down and then transport it away, clean it and dispose of it to make sure nothing gets into the, to the ground near the water. It's gonna be quite the show. Um, <laughs> April through June down there, if you wanna come down and take a look to see how, uh, how it's gonna go. A lot of times when you get the staining on the brick, it'll begin to snowball. Once there's already life and growth in some of these crevices, it's just gonna to continue to snowball and snowball. And what started out on the left, these are separate pictures from separate different locations, but you can see the severity. And over time, it's just gonna to continue to build up until it's completely taken out. We, this, this winter we looked at in, a condo complex that will remain nameless that neglected a lot of their masonry. And over the course of this neglect, they now have to have engineers come in and do a complete restructuring of the building, including what was it? They have to repour that slab. Yeah. The awning is just falling out of the building. You can see this is one of the awnings there on the bottom that will now have to be, so all the residents will have to find different ways to get into the buildings. They now have to rip off that cement slab there. They're either going to re-pour it or have a new one brought in. And this is just more of what happened there. The picture on the right, you can kind of see where the brick is shifting and the staircase on the left, which is no longer, no longer usable. So they had called us to come in to do a masonry repair. And while we're looking at it, you could fix the masonry, but it's just going to continue to crumble like this again. 
and this happened because it was neglected for so long and after a while you can only put so many band-aids on things before it becomes such a big issue that it needs to be completely redone um, very similar to what's happening in the towers on the uh, on the interior yeah this uh this condo board was in they were not in a good mood that day And that's about all the material we have. Can you tell us a little bit about your company? Yep, uh, Building Restoration Corporation. Um, our president, Dale Zorb, started it back when he was in high school, um, just laying bricks himself. Eventually things grew from there. He had to hire on more people, the building grew. Eventually, we opened up Madison Branch was 10 years ago, and Rochester would be probably about 10 as well, I think. So I'm the project manager here in the Madison shop. This will be Mike. He'll be the on-site foreman, um, and we'll have a crew of guys that will be working with us throughout the summer, um, would be including this project if you, if you guys decide to go that route. This summer? Yes, um, yep, uh, the Brides and Bells, the Bridal Boutique, right downtown here, um, we'll be working on, we'll be starting that one mid-July, I think, which is why we had thought that once that one's finished up, we could come over here and probably start late August, beginning of September, in that time frame. How long have you been this project taking? What was your name? And I think about 10 weeks, two months. It's a pretty straightforward project that's predictable. We can see a lot of what's going on already. The only thing that's kind of unknown would be the, the inside of the towers. But even then, there's only so much that can go wrong in there, so. Consistently has a crew of like six to eight. I don't know how many I'll have on this project. It all just vary on what we have going on with other things also this summer. What would you think an optimized group would be for something like this? Uh, four, four to five. Like pretty good for this four. Obviously, the more people, the more equipment you need to run, the more expensive it is. When we had prepared the bid, it was four people is what we had planned on. One guy in each lift and then two on the ground. I got a question up here. Yeah. So would you be staging all your equipment in the parking lot between the school and the church? So would the kids not have playground, et cetera, during that time? So that would be um, up to you. But ideally, we would like to park it off street. And then while it's parked back there, we would encage it in a six foot fence with a lock. So it wouldn't be just laying out for kids to crawl on. Excuse me, it would be secured. We won't, we won't need the whole park and that. We would probably just need a little corner of it to keep materials. We'd plan on bringing a 16 foot trailer and two lifts would be the only major equipment we have up here. Sure, we could definitely chop it up um, into different phases. I would say that the top priority will be getting those towers done for quite a few reasons, but that's definitely the appearance wise, that's the most elegant part of the church. You know, that's what gets the most attention. Second, it would be the water problem. Um, coming into the towers, the water issues there. And then uh, I, in the proposal, I had the two side-by-sides of just a difference of one year made. So that would be definitely the highest priority would be the towers. So I would say probably starting on the towers, that could be one phase. And then the rest would be going around the rest of the building. We're breaking up all the time for clients. 
like that, where we come back a year later, you know, do it in how many, as many phases as you need to do to make it work for the client. For us, this is, is a big project. Um, what are the typical size projects that we do? And, you know, in the reference, there's uh, 300,000 type uh, on dollar projects, and then there was a $2.9 million one in between. Uh, why not? But what, well, out, out of the management brand, what's, the, what's your wheelhouse of projects? What was that? Uh, I'd say we've consistently done stuff from 200 to 800. We also do smaller jobs as well. Um, I won't speak to the account, but the Brides and Bell is certainly not on in that range. So we do smaller jobs as well. Um, we just did a pair of chimneys in Delavan. Um, those were 25,000 and they were 30 foot tall, yeah. 33 chimneys that were up. So we do smaller projects as well, just depending on the crew and our availability. Warranties all vary. Um, are you looking like a craftsmanship warranty? Are you looking for a product warranty? Sure. Yeah, um, I would have to check um, the last time I knew our warranties, our craftsman warranties were five years. Um, and then all the individual products we use each have their own warranty. So for the sealant or the caulk, we do a pull test, is it? And then we could have a rep come out and they would tell you the warranty of that product. So a lot of people will say, you know, oh, the manufacturer of this sealant we use is a 15 year warranty, but that's not the actual warranty. It all depends on how it's applied, what temperature you applied it, you know, was it tooled? There's so many other variables that go into it. So anytime you hear someone say that, yes, we have a 15 year warranty on our sealant, please make sure to ask how they're gonna to get to that number because those numbers are not just given out by rep saying, you can tell anyone we have a 15 year warranty. In your uh, terms and conditions, uh, you mentioned a warranty. Um, anyway, you referenced uh, your standard uh, warranty. I wonder if you could provide us a copy of that. Was it not in there? Uh, I didn't see it. Let me try and find what it said in the um, your terms and conditions, item number three. Okay, I can provide one for you. So the, when we were going over the proposal, it was under our understanding that we would be using brick that would be provided to us as a match. So that number would change a bit depending on, yeah, um, if we have to go out, find, you know, the brick and everything like that, but it would be no more than, what was the, do you have the line item on there by chance on what it was per brick? No, 26, okay, then it would be no more than 36 per brick. That would include us driving to Indiana to go find the brick if we had to. Is there an industry standard publication that would follow this guideline or how, how, 
how would you think that if there was a, a, a difference of opinion on the Jeffrey exception, how, how would that be clarified? I'm not aware of any um, official manual, but I can say that we've never had an issue come up that we weren't able to resolve. So I guess, do you have a specific no, situation in mind or a, a hypothetical? I am not specifically aware of one, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Um, that's another thing I can double check for you and provide that if it's available. On, on the mortars, um, do you typically usually add increases in the mortars? No, we don't. No. So when it's like in, in new base grades, uh, quite frequently a uh, water repellent yeah, no, that's something that's something we would provide later after, like water repellents. No, there's nothing like that added to it. So not an interval. No. Would you provide that, or is that? It'd be an addition afterwards. I wouldn't really see that your uh, see that the church would really need something like that just because of the brick being a salt or uh, smooth surface. So it's not really going to do what it's supposed to do if you apply it to something like this. It's kind of meant more for like a porous brick. We had performed a rylum test on the building, which is basically it's a little plastic tube that you stick to the side of the building with water in it, and it replicates steady rainwater. And then as that, um, the vial is five milliliters, and as it deteriorates, in the amount of time it deteriorates, you could be able to tell how porous and how you know how much of a, a danger it actually is, and there was no no infiltration when we performed the test. So a lot of times, those things just aren't exactly necessary. Um, but we would be more than happy to provide you for a quote to do a full seal as well. Like a before and after of an inject? Did we have one in the altar? Yes, I, if we don't have one here, I can absolutely provide you one. These ones were all replaced, but I can provide that for you. Also in the um, proposal, Mentioned that sales tax is included on materials. Uh, we're a tax exempt uh, entity. Would you be able to get any credit for uh, saving the sales tax? I can get back to you on that one. That's not something I could speak to, um, but I, can, I will let you know. So, right now I have the warranty, I have the the, the tax exempt, I have the epoxy pictures. And then the general conditions of masonry, the book that exists. Yeah, that big fat book somewhere. Oh, we'll see. <laughs>
Yeah, so I don't know if 12 in your description here shows the quantity of working customers. Um, we have in the event of a lesser quantity of work uh, being performed by DRC, the calculate credit issued to the buyer at full discretion is to use a lesser of the unit price shown um, due to obviously uh, other certain materials and such. So you would say, for example, if we're going to estimate that we replace 100 bricks, then it would be plus or minus each brick per, you're looking for a unit price for each item? That's where I put it. Is it um, I guess one of the, my concerns is when we're talking about and the rest of the building, 30%, and the, the denominator is at 30%, is it constant? So I think what would be there is the overall total building that would be washed, I think was 16,000. <clears> the 30% of tuck pointing removes the square footage of the front addition. So without doing all the math, let's just call that 2,000. So that would be the remaining 4,000 removing the two towers that are gonna be 100% pointed would then bring that down to 10,000 and it would be 30% of 10,000 is how that quantity is calculated. And, and that, that's good. And so we probably just wanna make sure that that put the papers we all understand where the numbers come from. And what I'm actually looking at um, what this project got going is probably the increased area that we'd be looking Oh, yes, absolutely. And I think that I do have that written in the proposal in the line items there, the unit price. And if that's, if you want something more specific, absolutely, we can do that. So, in the proposal, are we looking solely at a unit price proposal here? I guess I don't understand the, the question. So, tuck pointing the North Tower, we have uh, 1,160 square feet, and you have about $21 per foot. Is that a unit price for the Is that extension of uh, $24,000? Is that a fixed price, or uh, would you hear uh, it would turn out to be, well, 1,400 square feet? Sure, so the tuck pointing amounts there are fixed. So that is what we have allotted in the budget. And you had brought up a change order, I'm assuming, you know, that's what the concern was. So the only change order we had anticipated on this would be repairing the material on the inside of the towers. Um, but that was, that was discussed, I believe. So that that is gonna be anticipated. Looking out throughout the exterior of the building, if there is any other, if it's gonna be 31% pointing, you know, that's not something we're gonna make a change order for. That's just something we're just gonna do. But if there's larger areas that are of significant concern to us, you know, then we will point that out to you. And the change order, of course, is an option. It's not mandatory. So the area that I see the biggest concern for us as a congregation is that 30%. Um, we, we we're going to be relying on I can't think of a situation where you've actually been that wrong yeah. on an estimate. That's a 10% of a building. That's a lot of square well, footage. Right down, that so, I mean, 10% of that, you'd be looking at 
maybe 1,500 square feet of tuck pointing. A rough guess that would be this floor layout right here. That's that's a lot to not see. And since there's nothing hidden, um, as I mentioned before, it's pretty straightforward on what we're expecting with this. We're able to look around. You know, we're able to test the brick. We've done a mortar test on it. We we know what we're getting into with this one. Is it? Um... I'm sorry. Don't want to find ourselves in, in, in a point of uh, argument and discussion of what is or is not. Yep. Makes sense. Yep. That's completely understandable. Um, what we can do is in a pre construction meeting, we use um, a program called Stack. It's an architectural program where we can take out the entire blueprint and I can draw squares, sections, and I can call out exactly where the pointing is to be expected. And from there, we can make sure we have that 30% covered. Um, if that's something that you'd be more comfortable with, and that's something that Mike and I usually do before jobs anyways. So when he's doing his overall look across the building, you know, he's gonna be calling out what's gonna be repointed, what's not gonna be repointed. And we can just make sure that that document gets to you. You're gonna be able to tell where we work from where you guys Yeah, I, I, I don't think we'll tell where you work. I just wanna make sure that, um, like a hundred percent cut and repoint of these two towers. The towers gonna to look brand new again. Yeah. If we, if we keep doing the blocks and stuff. It's just gonna look worse and worse. Yep. And so back to uh, so much of the, uh, the risk of change in, in, in the project. So right now you're proposing two eighty foot. For some reason, you need 125 foot in the same room. Who bears the risk of, of that change in the. Me. <laughs> we, we do as a company. So, the only kind of change order that would come through would be if there is some egregious thing that we missed in the masonry, which I, I don't think is the case. I mean, we all kind of, even through the pictures, you can see it's gonna be a predictable on what mortar is gonna fall out and what's not. And then the material on the inside of the building. Other than that, you know, a lot of times change orders are a big concern for people when there are a lot of unknowns in a building. Sometimes you cannot get back to see the condition of a brick unless you have that 100 foot lift or unless you have the crane to drop your lift up there. So there's a lot of times like that where change orders can kind of be unpredictable, um, but I don't find this to be one of those situations. And it is a lot of money. I do understand that. It's um, it's always difficult to shop for something when you don't really know what you're talking about. You know, I know when I first shopped for a lawnmower, it was, it was a bit much. I like to think I know what I'm doing, but then I get there and they're asking me about sizes and forward and reverse. And, I just pushed it. Yeah, of course, absolutely. I guess I just like that you did a good job addressing questions and moving forward. So, thank you. Thank yeah, of course. Any other questions, please ask. We want you to be just as comfortable with this as we are. Yeah. That's why we're here. Stan, you have my email. Um, anyone who wants to take a proposal, I know I brought a few extras that has all my contact information as well. I can leave 50 to 500 business cards in the back. I got plenty. So I'll just leave some back there. Um, I'll leave some with Stan in case anyone wants any questions answered immediately. I'm usually in bed by 8.30, try to keep the calls before that. Yeah. <laughs> I know, right? I'm gonna have to have that cup of coffee for the drive home. <laughs> well, well, I really appreciate you guys taking the time today to hear from us. Any questions at all, please feel free to reach out. Yeah, thank you.